when I first picked up my first six string, you know, this is my first electric guitar. I'd always loved music, I'd always felt a connection with it. When I picked up the guitar, there was something about it that it was like, you know, magnets that are, you just can't pull apart, you know what I mean? That, that natural fire was there for that. And um, it's hard for me to explain what that was, or you know, what that came from. Uh, whether it's raw, really any kind of raw talent, or whether um, it's time on the instrument, because ever since that day, I haven't been able to go a day without playing the guitar. You know, it's hard for me to not just pick up a guitar if I'm in a room with a guitar. a tremendous artist, and I mean to really say that sincerely, a very unique artist. I have Justin Johnson on the call. How's it going, Justin? Great, brother. How are you doing tonight? Hey, not too bad at all. Look, I wanted to have you back on. You did the show when I did primarily and only and solely an audio-only show. And as soon as I started doing video, I started thinking of guests that not only have a tremendous quality of their music but also a very, very unique presentation. And of course, you come to mind. And obviously, I'll, let me explain it to my audience. Then what we're going to do is we're going to get into some quick dialogue. Then I want to jump to an immediate visual of some of the work that you do. And you're here to, I guess, maybe you're going to perform a song live today. I wasn't sure you were. If, if you want me to, yeah. I've always got a guitar in my hand, so uh, I'd be happy to. Okay, actually, we'll pull that off because actually, shockingly enough, when I record full rock bands, it's kind of sketchy. But if I do an acoustic or solo artist, it usually comes out pretty good. So let me give a little preamble of, of yourself. And if I get anything wrong, you correct me. You do, first of all, you do mostly original music. I know you do a couple covers once in a while. You did one for Johnny Be Good recently for uh, Chuck Berry's, right? Yeah, definitely. I like I like to hit the classics and uh, pay homage to that and to that history. But I also love writing music and, and taking the music somewhere it's never been. Okay, and uh, I'll express a, another thing that's very unique about you is the the style of instruments that you play. For instance, I wrote them down here, and I wrote down some of the pieces of music. For instance, you do play a a shovel guitar, which I talked about in our first interview. No one got to see it. Now they get to see it on this show. You play a shovel guitar, which is obviously a real shovel that you might use for digging. or, or So that's one of the instruments. You also play a wash, not a wash board. What's a wash bucket or wash pail? or Yeah, a wash tub guitar. Wash so tub, guitar, right. yeah, the resonating body is from a small wash tub. Okay, see, I did some research here on the instruments. An oil... Oil type of can, correct? I've seen that as well. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. So now, you know what we're going to do is, is let's talk about, first of all, let's talk real quickly about the uniqueness of the instruments. And I want to make sure we show a video of you playing one of the unique instruments. But I'm sure a lot of these instruments, when people think about them, if you just tell them about the instrument, they're going to think, well, how much bass are you going to get from this instrument? Maybe the wash tub because it's a, a larger volume where you would think you could get a good bass from that. But a shovel guitar, they're going to think there's no, there's actually no structure there to carry on any bass. They're going to think of it to be too trebly. So first of all, the instruments sound phenomenal. And let's discuss that first. How, how do you get these instruments that are of you, these unique qualities? Are they experimental? Do they have to be massaged a bit to figure out what works? How does all this happen? Yeah, it's a, a good question. It's a question I get a lot. You know, basically, uh, um, hearing, uh, you know, well, first of all, people ask, why do you have instruments made out of these found objects? And does it contribute to the sound in a positive way? Um, you know, because you think, you know, a lot of people are used to wood, you know, guitar is made out of wood. Mm -hmm. um, that's not always true. I mean, this guitar right here is a, a traditional instrument, a classic instrument, the, the acoustic resonator guitar, and this is made out of wood and metal. Um, you have completely, you know, metal uh, resonators as well that don't have the wood at all in the body. Um, you have a lot of these different materials, 
But you know, when you think about the, uh, just take the shovel guitar for example. I've got it right here, actually. Oh, cool! And we get to uh, see it. Uh -huh. You see, the the shovel is the entire guitar from the body to the neck to the headstock is the handle of the shovel. And it's surprising, especially with this specific shovel and the way that it's put together, it's designed to be a lot like an archtop electric guitar. Uh -huh. see, see, the shape of the shovel is much like an archtop. It has a tailpiece, it has a bridge, it has a contour to the body. The strings go across the neck to the nut. And really, you play it exactly like you play a conventional guitar, only this set has no frets, so you have to play it with a slide. But it sustains like crazy. I mean, when you play, you know, acoustically, it doesn't have a whole lot of volume to it. But that's no different than, let's say, a Les Paul or a Fender Strat. Right, um, true. Solid body electric guitars aren't designed to acoustically project any music. They're just designed to sustain. The resonance is inside the body. It's not in, like, a sound chamber. It's actually in the wood itself. The tempered steel shovel has, uh, to me, to my ear, and to the feel, as much sustain as something like a, a Strat or a Les Paul, a big block of wood, only it's so dense, that tempered steel, that it resonates in a much smaller uh, package. You know what I mean? It sustains in that, in that small blade. Yeah, now, so, so I'm curious. How did you, and then we're going to play a track, I promise, because I want to make sure we see the visual of that instrument being played. But I'm curious, what... what Obviously, or not obviously, but probably, when you first started playing the guitar at a younger age, what age were you when you first started? Were you like five, six, seven, nine? You know, I got serious when I was a teenager, um, but I, my first guitar that I ever picked up was much, uh, you know, before that, it was this little one-string beater that was lying around the house uh, that was, huh. you know, I, it only had one rusted string on it, but um, so yeah, since I was about a teenager, I'd say I've been really seriously playing Okay, but, but I was going to get at that probably you played a more traditional instrument at the very beginning of your career. Now, you had that one that was the rusted one-string instrument, but then probably from there you progressed to the typical Telecaster, Stratocaster, maybe a Hummingbird. Is that probably true? I'm sure that you didn't just pick up a shovel and say, oh, at the age of 12, I'm going to, instead of shoveling snow, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to create an instrument out of it. Now, So how did you come about obtaining your first very unique instrument and what was that instrument and what made you love it to experiment more with it or maybe maybe you didn't maybe you dropped it for a while and then you rediscovered it so give me that history yeah well, well you're right you know when i started seriously playing six string it was on conventional electric and acoustic six string guitars um it wasn't until i've been performing as a uh, you know professional musician about 10 years uh, that i got my first uh, Roots instrument. It was a handmade four-string guitar uh, that had a cigar box for the body. And someone brought it to a show, actually, and just handed it to me when I was on a break and said, hey, you want to play a song with this? And um, I had no idea how to tune it. I didn't even know what strings were on it. And uh, But I thought, you know, this is cool. Let me, let me see what I can do with this. Uh, and so I basically made up a tuning for it on the spot. I uh, plugged it into the amp, it, it sounded great through the amp, and uh, so I just started making up a song on it, on stage, uh, at the show. And it sounded great, you know, I mean, it, it had this soul, it had this vibe that, I, I mean, it was like something that was missing from what I was doing, I felt that immediately, you know. Uh -huh. um, it, it had this rootsier, sort of a chaotic kind of vibe to it, and tone to it, and so... Um, you know, it, it was the beginning of the rabbit hole, man. I just fell right into it head first. And I, once I got my first uh, Roots instrument, it's like the next one I got sounded totally different. But it had that same character. It had that same soul. It was like, oh, God, this is, a, you know, this is a sound that I, I'm, I'm connecting with like crazy. And... Um, you know, one thing led to another. Now, now I have about 350 uh, plus uh, roots instruments from all over the world that have been sent to me or given to me on tour. Uh, people wanting to try out new things, and uh, now I'll, it's I've got instructional DVDs on how to do it. You know, so that I can help people learn how to do it on their own and started an online music school for roots music and roots instruments uh, called RootsMusicSchool.com so that other people could really learn how to do this and 
you know, it's just taken off so organically. Wow, very interesting. Very cool story. So the initial first instrument that you got, it was kind of a gutsy move to play that on stage, plug it in. Obviously, when you're on stage, you want to make sure that your best performance is out there. So it was, it was kind of a gutsy move to do that, and it worked out well for you. Now, when you're at gigs now, do you have people in the audience that are coming in with some, maybe they have some greasy fingers because they've been putting instruments together, and they come in there <laughs> and they expect you to, to rap with their instrument? Obviously, you want to maintain a quality of the show that you're doing. You don't want to turn it into like a an experimental circus of type. So you do have to be, as, as a no musician, musician develops their following and develops their professionalism, you kind of maybe can't take that risk like you maybe did in the past. Maybe that's true, or maybe maybe you're just that unique guy where you'll you'll just go with the flow. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, almost every show I do, I invite people to come out and bring instruments to. And, uh, you know, what it's become is it's become sort of a culture at my shows and my performances that people, uh, not only the builders who might bring instruments out, but the audience loves seeing something that was just made that day. Or maybe, you know, it was something that has sentimental value. I don't know how many stories I've heard of people saying this was my dad's or my grandpa's, this, this object. And, Instead of just sitting around the house, they made an instrument out of it. And uh, they come out and they bring it to a show, and then I can tell the story of that instrument. And then, you know, a lot of times I'll be the one to play an instrument for the first time ever. Like, they just strung it up, and I get to share that and tell everyone there, you know, this is the first sound you're going to hear out of a musical instrument. And, you know, that's something people find, you know, at the end of the show, they tell me, you know, that, that song you did on that instrument that that guy brought out or something like that. You know, they might say that was one of the coolest things I've seen at a concert in a long time. Absolutely. It, you know, you're, you're pulling the audience into the story, to the art of that, and then also to the history of everyone who's been doing that for centuries. And so I love doing that at shows and, and workshops when I do that. Well, now this is fascinating, and, and I keep asking questions because I, I'm uniquely fascinated by this. So one more question that we do have to play a song because I want to make sure people just, they want to see this instrument. But I'm curious yeah. about this. When someone comes up from the audience with an instrument, and do you, do you pull them up on stage? Because part of it you mentioned is the history of that instrument, how they created it, how they were inspired to create it, and to get their impression of it while you're playing it. Because some people obviously that are developing these pieces of equipment. They may not be the quality of artist that you are. So, in fact, if I have a guitar, I can't make it sound like the guitar teacher that taught me how to play that instrument because I, I don't have his talent and I don't have his study as well. The two of them together made my guitar teacher the quality of player he is. So to have that instrument that someone created on stage experimenting or having the instrument played, performed, with the quality of sound that it's capable of, that you can bring out of it, that in itself is something that, do you bring that individual up on stage and then have a short discussion with them, a history, et cetera, with them? It depends on the context, really, as far as that goes. Uh, sometimes, you know, let's say it's at a, a workshop. So, you know, a lot of times uh, before a show, I might offer a workshop where there's more time to talk about the actual, you know, talk to the builder with people there, bring the instrument up, talk about the instrument. Um, and then, you know, that's really when I have the time to bring everyone together. And then even if it's a very simple instrument, um, even if the instrument has, uh, you know, maybe even a defect or the builder's just learning how to play, uh, that's a good venue. You know, those workshops, instructional workshops are a good venue for me to say to everybody, you know, like, give this builder a round of applause for bringing this up because it, it takes a lot of guts to bring something up. You might not even be sure it's going to work. And then people can, I don't tell people, well, this is how I make it work. This is how I make it sound the way I do. And then sometimes someone might bring something up and, and it just plays beautifully. I mean, you know, the, the craftsmanship of some of these, even, you know, pure hobbyists that do this and then they, they bring an instrument out. It's just uh, amazing how nice some of them are. And of course, if I'm playing, you know, a large festival and I've got a short set or, you know, um, there's not a lot of time to talk to people that I'm meeting for the first time on stage, I might not be able to have as much time as I do in a workshop to do something like that. But, uh, you know, any chance I can get, I love to showcase the artwork that these uh, luthiers are making. 
these Roots Instrument Builders. And uh, honestly, it's just fun. You know what I mean? I just love yeah. doing it. Well, it's great fun to have you on the show. So let's play a track of music. You sent me a few of them. Can we start off with one of the more unique ones, which is the shovel, or should we should we leave that for the middle as a as a pinnacle of the show? What do you recommend? Let's let's, let's go ahead and play that shovel guitar video. That'd be a good one. Okay, and the the track is called "Cranking It Up." Okay, and it's an original piece written by yourself as well, right? Actually, uh, when you're watching the video, you get to see the minute I uh, wrote it. Uh, it was actually an improvisation that I met, that I uh, just kind of came up with for that video. We were out back, and Nikki was recording, and uh, but it became so popular that that's actually now a song that's on a, on my upcoming album, Driving It Down. That I'll be doing. The, you know, the full band arrangement is on that album, but you get to see the moment of inspiration basically in that video when you're watching it. Very cool. So here we go. This is Justin Johnson on the Dave Darren Show. And we tremendous artist in are you in nashville right now yes very cool do you travel a lot obviously you have a good opportunity to travel a lot of instruments you how's your van is it filled with a bunch of instruments or how do you do this um you mean for my live shows yeah for your live shows you have such a diverse amount you said you have how many hundreds of, of these unique instruments did you say like 300 of them or yeah, about 350 plus on the last count. And, um, you know, generally when I tour, and uh, it, I'll try to play 
as many unique instruments as I can, you know, tastefully fit into the set, you know, because I want people to see and hear the difference between these instruments. I mean, they really are like members of the band to me, you know. Uh, I want to give them a spotlight. I want to showcase what they do. And, um, you know, I fall in love with the sound of each one also, so it's hard to write a song on, let's say, the shovel guitar and then play it on any other instrument, you know. It's a... And that's part of the show, and that's part of the magic of it also. So, you know, for my live shows, generally, I perform by myself, but I can have up to a dozen or more instruments sometimes at a show. Wow, tremendous. Now, I'm interested in this as well. Obviously, you said you have a workshop, and you have people who create these products. How do you mix and match? Obviously, you know, there's a formula with Fender and Gibson to mix and match the pieces of wood, whether it's the fretboard's different, whether it's the neck is different. The, the body of the guitar, they have a formula for what they're creating. They even probably have a formula for a P90 pickup, what instrument it sounds best at. How do you match all of this stuff up? How do you figure out uh, strings or st everyone has different strings thicknesses? There, there's a, is, is there a formula or does there not have to be a formula because you're comfortable with the uniqueness that that instrument has just by its unique setup of all these components? I know what you mean, and it's it's one of those things where I believe time is what brings those formulas out. Time and success or failure, you start to learn what works and what doesn't. You know, there have been so many electric guitar the guitars built by. I mean, you could just say by Fender. You know what I mean? Fender alone, who knows how many guitars they've built, but they've learned through trial and error. This is going to get you more sustain. This is going to get you a brighter tone. This is going to get you a darker tone. This is, and then they zero in. That is, this is the classic Fender sound now. You know, this is what we're chasing. And then this is how you modify it. These are things that all guitar builders uh, chase, and they, they kind of come up with their own sounds and their own techniques that way. Um, when you're building a roots instrument, uh, let's say it's out of found objects, something that you might not know this is going to sound a certain way, then it, you're starting from the beginning of that whole process. You know, you're saying, you know, I wonder, that shovel kind of looks like a guitar. I wonder what that's going to sound like. And you, put, you build a guitar out of it. And then that first guitar, you might say, well, that sounds awesome. And then you build your second one and you say, I'm going to do this to it. That might not sound as good. And so you chase this tone. And, uh, you know, with what I do, I'm lucky enough from the player's perspective to have played thousands and thousands of roots instruments, you know, whether they're made out of license plates or wash tubs, um, you know, all these different items, uh, bicycles, tennis rackets, crutches, you know, like there's no end to uh, the kinds of objects that people have, you know, said, let's make a guitar out of that. And so, I mean, I've refined in my own head a lot of the materials that I like, you know, there's certain types of shovels that I like better. There's certain year license plates and certain country license plates that I like better. And I've you know that I've noticed that's the sweet spot for that type of object. Wow. And I think, you know, that's time and experience that that takes you down that path. I could I could just see you on the road driving down the highway, going about ten miles over the speed limit. A policeman follows you, pulls you over, there's no license plate in the back of your car. And he says, Well first of all, Justin, <laughs> give me your Give me your driver's license registration. And where's your license plate? Did it fall off? And you say, no, it's on my guitar. And he's looking at you <laughs> like, well, well, what, well, what's this? And then you pull out the guitar with the license plate on it, right? <laughs> yeah. That's not, that's not far from the truth. When I, when I moved here to Tennessee, I took off my old uh, North Carolina license plate. And uh, I think right when I posted a message that I did that, I got about seven requests for people wanting to build guitars out of my old license plate. So, uh, wow. <laughs> Incredible. You now it's, it's fun because, you know, also then you start looking at objects and it's, you start thinking, I wonder what that sounds like. You know, I wonder what that chair sounds like or that old, like, um, I've got a lap steel that was made out of an old weather barometer from the 1840s. And it sounds so haunting, the tone of it, and it sounds so old and vintage. And uh, so, you know, like there's certain woods, you can never get the sound of an old wood, no matter how nice the wood is, if it's new. It hasn't gone through the aging process. So if you find these really old items also at antique stores and places like that, 
a lot of times they sound so amazing when you you build a nice instrument out of them. Well, it's funny. One time I was in uh, I was in Las Vegas and I went to see this comedian Carrot Top. You're familiar with this guy? Yeah, he's, he's yeah. Like, he's a little bit popular. He does a lot of magic with props. And he was talking about going to some of these stores and just maybe they're like a Goodwill store or something like that and rummaging through and having ideas in his head of what kind of comic appeal he could have for that piece that he found at Goodwill. I can imagine you going to these antique stores with with a shopping cart and just putting it chuck full, <laughs> overflowing with different ideas that come from your head, right? But oh, yeah. probably, no, probably no joke, right? <laughs> Nikki and I, wherever we go on tour, um, you know, one of the things we always love to do is is go to antique malls and antique stores, yeah. not just to look for you know you know things that could sound really cool or look really cool on an instrument, but you also end up learning about the history of the places you're going in a really cool way, and you see um, you know what was there at this time, and those stories end up becoming a big part of the inspiration too for the music and for instruments, things like that. Cool. I'll tell you what, we wrapped a lot in the first segment. We wrapped a little bit shorter here. Let's play another piece of uh, music, and then we're going to come back and talk to you some more. What should we do second? Recommendation from you. Um, let's try, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about my upcoming album, Driving It Down, and one of the, the tracks from that is called Got the Chicken, and uh, this is another song, just like Cranking It Up, where the inspiration for it came when I was just having fun, doing a live stream actually uh and i was just making up a song it ended up i ended up playing it for like 10 minutes and uh the next day we went into the studio and i recorded it with the full band so this uh this song is called uh, tennessee hill country blues but uh if you get the driving it down album it'll be called got the chicken well how about that because i did have the one and i was wondering what so there is a name change in that okay so very cool yeah. we'll play the video it's a tremendous track and here we go on the date parent <laughs>
break from our show for a word from our sponsor. Starting from right now, from the moment that you started this freaking video. The creamiest, creamiest, salt ice cream you get from Mr. Softy. <laughs> Dave Darren Show! Hey buddy, try it on! Brought to you by our very cool sponsor... Cool Air feels good! Rock Solid Talent Entertainment! The cutting edge of entertainment bringing you bands, radio, and live streams into the 21st century! Everyone's gonna wanna hang out with me! Woohoo! Yeah! Welcome back. Justin on the Dave Barron Show here. We're talking about the uniqueness of instruments. Let's talk a little bit about the workshop. Is that something that, that you started? Are you the major driving force behind that? Are you a contributor to working with the developers of these pieces of equipment to work with them to develop instrumentation? How, how firmly involved are you in that? Are you the founder of it? Tell me about that. Well, the, the workshops I was talking about earlier um, that I do when, you know, a lot of times when I put on a performance or whether I'm doing a festival performance at a festival, um, they'll want an instructional workshop on roots music. And so, you know, I like to make sure that I can have an opportunity to connect with the people coming out who not only want to watch the show, um, but they want to dive a little deeper into, you know, their questions or, or you know, Techniques, playing styles, whether it's with roots music, uh, slide guitar, uh, blues guitar, anything like that. And then um, when it comes to, you know, actually being in the workshop, you know, and actually building instruments, innovating new instrument designs and things like that, um, I love working with companies. I, I work with companies, uh, guitar companies, um, designing a line of acoustic guitars right now with the company. Um, working on pedal designs, um, and then, of course, helped uh, hundreds of different builders, you know, just developing a tighter way to approach roots instrument design or guitar building from the player's perspective. This um, has got to be tremendous for the kids because obviously you have the creative early minds who are trying to absorb something new. Everyone now, you know, the younger kids, the younger guys, are, they're always looking for something new whether it's their new app for their cell phone, they're grasping at anything that's new. You've got not only music, you've got a means for them to discover history in an interesting way. It's almost like you have a little bit of science thrown in there. And so it's, it's all working for the, the young kids must be really grooving this, right? They must be really loving it. Absolutely. You know, every, every time I've gone into a school and taught kids, um, whether it's how to build and play a roots instruments, or, you know, just doing presentations like that. Um, I love seeing that spark in kids, you know, because I remember when I fell in love with the guitar, I mean, it was it was 100%, you know, I dove into it. And I can see those kids that have that look in their eye. You know they're going to fall in love with music. You know they're going to pursue it. And, um, you know, you hit the nail on the head talking about, though, how you could take something as fun and as interesting as, as rock and roll or, you know, electric guitar or something like that. And you can use it as a way to be able to teach kids about science and about electronics, about woodworking, about technology, about history, you know, about math, all of these things. And a lot of times, you know, the schools that I've worked with over the years, um, a lot of them don't have music departments anymore. And so, you know, I've worked with teachers who want to try to find creative ways to bring music back into the school. And the way to do that is through teaching those things that you're talking about. You know, te teaching math, teaching technology, teaching science, teaching those different things through music. And then they can justify teaching it at school. You know, it's, it's a shame that they're losing so many music departments, but I'm glad there's, you know, people out there trying to make it relevant. Yeah, you know what? One thing that's going to be a problem here is you're probably pissing off guitar teachers. Guy, a student comes in, he brings in a shovel guitar. The guy's looking at him like, "I'm usually teaching on like a Stratocaster or a Les Paul. What is this?" 
Hey, the six string's always going to be cool, though. You know what I mean? That's I, never going to yeah, go out of style. I can see the guitar teacher. The kid walks in with a shovel. And he, he tells him, "Get out of here! I hit you over the head with his shovel." <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but let me ask you this question as well. Uh, obviously, all the uniqueness of these instruments. I noticed that some of them are, are three strings, as you mentioned. Was one of them a two string even? Or you mentioned a earlier very very first guitar that you had was a single string guitar. All of yeah. the, all of the different strings that that adds a uniqueness and it adds an extra a extra course of study to be able to play those few notes to get the whole line of obviously when people think of music they think of the octaves within an instrument and you uh -huh. have you have less octaves because you have less strings so that adds a complication to it so how do you how do you get on do you have to work with an instrument for a certain amount of time to figure out not only the acoustics of it the sound of it matching it with the pedal if you want to use a pedal on it and figuring out how to play the notes of that guitar it's it's got to be somewhat complicated you're probably uniquely talented enough to pull it off but it's not an easy task right it's it's not you know but you know learning anything like an instrument is always going to be uh, two things, you know, you got to learn the mental side of it, um, and you got to learn the physical side of it. You know what I mean? So um, even if you know, sometimes I'll actually I'm right-handed when I play. Sometimes I'll actually switch over left-handed when I'm practicing because it reminds me that there's a physical element to it. You know, I still know everything I know about how to play guitar, but I just physically you know, haven't practiced left-handed as much as I've practiced right-handed. So there's a, a barrier there. So no matter how much you know about music or how much you're feeling what you want to play, if you have a passion for music, you still have to train yourself to do it. Uh, the muscle memory, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that's where the passion comes in because that, the passion is what keeps you going through it in those times when you're just, you know, getting better. You're learning songs. You're learning where to put your fingers, that kind of thing. But, you know, when it comes to, like you mentioned, the single-stringed instruments, the two, the three-stringed instruments, what that happened, you know, like I said, when I picked up my first four-string, my first three-string, started learning roots instruments, um, I was already proficient. I was already a professional musician playing conventional six-string guitar and four-string bass. And um, it, it made me pull back. It made me pull back to a simpler way of thinking about stringed instruments, about about the guitar. And, um, you know, I can hear, I'll play you something just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So this is, a you know, a six-string resonator guitar right here. And a lot of times, if you play it, you're doing conventional chord shapes, conventional patterns that you're used to learning and standard tuning, things like that. If I were to just play one string on this instrument almost all of those patterns would become very difficult to then apply to one, one string. So you have to learn to sing on the instrument. You have to learn with a slide. If you're playing something like a one string diddly bow that doesn't have any frets, you learn how to make that one string vocalize, make it sing. So you only have an octave, like you said, on this guitar, maybe an octave, a few notes above it. You have to start a rhythm, then a melody, let's say you want to add two strings to that, you can, now you, you have both harmony and you can have a bass line and a melody. So I can start on that low string and then play the same thing I just played on the top. Add all six, then you can... So you 
you start with that one simple string, you develop it, and then you can, you know, you have an orchestra instead of one instrument. You know, you have six voices instead of just one guitar voice. Well, you know, I wonder, you know, obviously when, well, not obviously, but when I first learned how to play the guitar, it was an introduction to the instrument as a six-string unit. Maybe exactly. part, Maybe part of teaching these days should be understanding the significance of each string. I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking that because I, I don't. I never learned the significance of a one string instrument, and you're uh -huh. teaching. You're kind of teaching that if you understand each string, you can develop a string by string approach to guitar and projecting it to the full equipment, right? Exactly, yeah, and, and then again, you know, each string you start to realize each string has its own tone. Um, when you change the string, you're changing the tone. Uh, if you want it to sound with a certain voice, you know, you let that string do the melody. You don't move it to the next string. And then with alternate tunings, um, you know, before I learned how to play the one string diddly bow, I only used standard tuning. Even with slide guitar, which used a lot of open tunings, I only used standard tuning. And it wasn't until I really became, you know, very proficient in playing one string at a time that I realized, okay, I'm, I started making up my own tunings. I started saying, well, I want the low string to be in this range. I want the high string to be in this range. I want the middle strings to have this chord as their voice. And then I, you know, realized, well, now I hardly ever use standard tuning. And, I, you know, it's something that I didn't even realize happened. Wow. This is truly amazing. It really is. We're learning a whole lot, and I'm so glad you're sharing it with all of our audience there who who obviously are a love of instruments, a love of their genre of music, and a love of learning about the true uniqueness of other instruments. This is really a, a cool interview, so I love it. And uh, so let me ask you this question. When you're playing in front of your audience, uh, there's a lot of bands out there who offer a uniqueness of music and a uniqueness to their appearance on stage. Maybe you can even think of like Kiss, if you want to reflect back to them. They have a unique look of themselves on stage. I know that periodically they performed without the makeup, but just take Kiss as the makeup. So they've got an entertainment value to the look of themselves, as well as a proficiency in the music you're used to hearing. So you add that as well. You add, when you're on stage, you add, uh, obviously you dress really well too. So you, you have a, that appeal of, of how you look, very, very quality look to you. I, I love this look, by the way. And you've got a uniqueness to the instruments that you carry with you, as well as a proficiency of instrumentation. So it, it's got to be a thrill to see you on stage. I'm sure everyone hangs out after your set is finished and hopes to talk to you, right? Because it's, it's like a whole event. Oh, you know, we, you always want to make it an event. You want to make it entertaining. Uh -huh. And um, it's, you know, I love self-expression. I love creativity. And I love supporting other people's self-expression and creativity. I encourage everyone to be like that. And, um, you know, that's what entertainment's all about. You know, my heroes, like, you look at people like Jimi Hendrix and, uh, uh, you know, James Brown, people like uh, Bootsy Collins, who, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud to say uh, was a co-producer and writer and uh, performed on my upcoming album. Uh, you look at people like that, you know, some of my heroes, and it's like, you just love seeing them do what they do, you know what I mean? And, and just hearing them talk and just seeing the personalities that they are. I think that that's awesome when people have that and they bring that into the show and they bring that into the, you know, to the fans the way they do. And I'm sure that I, I can just capture this from the interview here, that when you're on stage and you're performing for the audience, you're just loving projecting yourselves into that crowd. I, I'm, I, I can just see from this interview here that that is just, you are so connected to that. It's obviously oh, true, I, right? I love it. You know, I'm, there was a time when I was, um, you know, first uh, learning to perform. You know, I mean, the first, very first times I stood on stage and really got out there playing, um, I was very nervous, not about performing at all, but I, I was just, you know, nervous in the environments I was there, everything I was doing. Once I got on stage, that was the, you know, the calmest moments of my life for when I'm on stage. That's when I'm really able to, I think, just be myself and be comfortable. And um, I think that's something that, to me, you know, it tells me this is what I should do for a living. This is what I love. This is where I am comfortable. 
and I love sharing that energy with the audience. I love when the audience is there and, and they're, you know, in on it, that chemistry. You hear people talk about it all the time, but, you know, that's something magical that happens in performances, and um, I always love to share that with the fans that come out, for sure. Now, would you say would you say you have a more of a raw talent or do you have more of a learned talent? I mean, did you just come out of the box this way or did you really study your craft to build up to where you are now? Well, you know, when I first picked up, when I first picked up my first six string, you know, this is my first electric guitar. Um, I'd always loved music. I always felt a connection with it. And I played instruments up to that point, like the trumpet, the baritone, you know, piano, uh, different things like that. Um, and I love music, but when I picked up the guitar, there was something about it that it was like, you know, magnets that are, you just can't pull apart. You know what I mean? That, that natural fire was there for that. And um, it's hard for me to explain what that was or, you know, what that came from, uh, whether it's raw, any kind of raw talent or whether um, it's time on the instrument because ever since that day, I haven't been able to go a day without playing the guitar. You know, it's hard for me to not just pick up a guitar if I'm in a room with a guitar. And so it's like, you know, all of that time is practice. All of that helps you develop the things that you need to learn to be proficient. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, you know, when I was just diehard, I am, you know, in my practice mode, probably more than ever in my life, uh, the types of practice I would put myself through, uh, I would make up ways to practice guitar that I'd never heard of before. Um, I'd practice all day with one hand, you know, only one hand. I'd try to learn how to play songs with, with only my left hand, without my right hand strumming them. Um, I practice for hours at a time in, in the dark, locked in my bathroom with the lights off so I could practice some um, blind playing. And, um, you know, I would leave my slide on my hand for uh, days or, you know, a week at a time without taking it off so that it just became part of my body. Um, different things like that. So it's definitely a combination of, I think, passion and an ability and a desire to want to get better and practice at the same time. Well, it's funny when you say when you first pick up a guitar, actually you seldom pick up a guitar. <laughs> You're picking up a shovel, <laughs> an oil can, right? You're, and actually it's funny, you don't pick up Fender or Gibson. You're picking up mostly like a John Deere product. But I'm curious about this. You know, it's 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 both. And I, you know, I like to make sure that people know that, you know, the fact that I do love roots instruments, I love homemade instruments and improvised instruments like that, um... I love classic instruments as well, and I love the new companies that are out there uh, that are making new electric guitars and acoustic guitars because there's, you know, there's no one thing that's better than anything else, you know, and um, with my, especially like the Driving It Down album and my last album before that, If Walls Could Talk, um, I played, uh, you know, a lot of traditional instruments and roots instruments, and I think they both have their place in it all, so... You know, I love Fenders, I love Gibsons and everything like that, but, you know, there's also times when you just can't beat a three-string shovel, you know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. I'm curious <laughs> about this. I've, I studied jazz for a while, and if you listen to some of the jazz greats, for instance, George Benson, who I, I happen to think is a very good guitar player, oh, yeah. before him was like Wes Montgomery, these people had the ability to be able to sing as they're on the fretboard they would be able to sing the note that they're going to play. And that and I, I have a feeling, and I, I don't have that quality of talent to me, but I have a feeling that they don't... I probably guess that they're thinking of the notes in their head and the melody of those notes and just knowing where to lay it on the fingerboard. Is that something that you do? Do you have the ability to sing the note and sing a note right now and play it on the guitar? And, and Do you do that? That's not, you know... When I'm playing, it's a sort of a mix between the the tones in my head, the uh, pitches in my head. You know, if I know I'm in a certain key, um, I know that these spots on the fretboard are going to be the right ones in that key for the notes that I'm hearing. When it comes to just like what you're talking about, being able to hit a pitch, um, while I can't do it, you know, vocally, I can do it in my head a lot better and on the fretboard a lot better. 
But you know, I think the thing that I that is actually going on in my mind or in my soul, whatever you want to say, um, when I'm improvising or when I'm writing music, is that I try to put myself in the feeling of the song. I try to make myself feel like emotionally what I want the song to feel like emotionally and whether that's just you know rock and roll whether that is a very meditative feeling or whether it's you know retros you know introspective you know uh, thinking of something happy or sad whatever it is you know I think the emotional quality is the thing that gets communicated whether you even hit the pitch or not, you know what I mean? And I think you listen to some of that old roots and blues music and some of the most gut-wrenching blues and some of the most tear-jerking, you know, sad songs are out of key. They are, the rhythms fluctuate. They're total, you know, you could say uh, theoretical imperfections all over the music. But the feeling is just like a tidal wave when it hits. Yeah, feeling's dead on, right, Absolutely. I'll tell you what, if we can. Yeah, that's the technique I try to focus on, though. Excellent, excellent. Can you play a piece here? You mentioned that you don't mind playing a piece live here for the show. Yeah. So if you don't mind doing that, that'd be tremendous. Tell us what you're doing and tell us the inspiration or the inspiration behind it. Or maybe you're going to do something just ad lib, whatever you feel like doing. What are you going to do? Yeah, I guess I'll just kind of let things go. I'll just, uh, I guess the only restriction will be I'm playing this uh, six string resonator and it's an open D tuning. And uh, I can only play slide with it because the action's so high. But I'm just gonna have some fun and see what see what comes out. Absolutely incredible. Tremendous technique as well. Did, did you, when you first started, obviously you probably did not play the slide guitar. And a lot of people don't do that. They don't play a slide guitar, but it sounds tremendous. I, I don't play the slide guitar. I'm encouraged to do it now. Is, is that a, is that something that's hard to learn, a slide? It, it's obviously very different than the traditional. Is, is it something that's hard to accomplish? You know, it's, it's got its challenges, uh, just like any technique. Um, you know, I think the thing that is, uh, I guess, the biggest challenge right off the bat is that, you know, the frets on the, the fretboard are in specific places so that you'll stay in tune when you're playing. But with the slide, you can hit any of those in-between spots, so you have to be exactly, exactly where that fret is with the middle of that slide for that note to come across. Yeah, that um, that always it's, fascinates me because, for instance, a lot of bass players, especially the upright, I, I don't know if there is even an upright bass that has frets on it, but it always seems remarkable to me that they can sound that precise and that great. However, maybe they're not being precise. Maybe it's the fluctuations in between that add flavor to the music. So maybe I'll have to listen to it more completely because maybe it is the variances in it that make it creative. Is that true? Is the... The notes in between, are they making things more creative and maybe I'm just hearing things that I'm not aware I'm being so flavored to listen to? 
Well, you know, there's a, and it depends on what you're going for. You know, um, slide sounds great on, on certain things, and then fretted notes are, are more tasteful, I think, on certain styles. But I like to equate the slide guitar with a vocalist. Uh, the vocal, the techniques that a vocalist uses, like sliding up to a note or sliding down to a note, um, the vibrato that they use, which is like, here's the note, and it's when you waver around the note. Um, when you're playing fretted, you can only bend, so you can only go sharp, you can only go above the note. But when you're playing slide, you can go below and above the note. So, um, you know, if I just wanted to play a line, with the slide that shows some of those inflections, let's say the line is a uh, those three notes. I'm trying to play them very, you know, fret-like on that one. Right. The notes, but you could go slide it uh, up to each note, slide down to certain notes, and then the vibrato you get is much more of a vocal vibrato. So you have much more room to go add these inflections between the notes. Yeah, I never thought of that. You're right. And some of the vocalists that I really appreciate do add that flavor to their music. They go up, they come down. There's not a preciseness. There's that continual variance, which adds, it adds an, the ear catches that and maybe it doesn't actually realize what's going on. So great demonstration. Thanks so much for that. So yep. do you do you prefer playing as a soloist or a, a part of a band or, or does it matter just the flavors of the differences make it interesting and, and I'm sure... Probably you love them both, I'm assuming, right? Exactly. Um, you know, I love I love listening to both, and I love performing both. Um, my new album, Driving It Down, uh, which is going to be released on April 1st, is actually my first solo release uh, with a full band. And so my past two uh, albums, I've done all the overdubbing myself. I've played every instrument on both of those albums. Driving It Down is new and different. As far as that's concerned, because um, we've got drummers, vocalists, horn players, keyboard, you know, B3, clavinet, uh, and just some amazing talent, some amazing people who contributed their talent and their passion to this album. And I can't wait for people to hear it, man. I'm excited about it. And that comes out April 1st. is going to be available, I'm sure, on iTunes. Or how do people grab a hold of that? How do people engage with you beyond the interview here? The best place happen? to do that for everything is my website, justinjohnsonlive.com. And, um, you know, you can get connected with the Facebook, which is also, you know, Facebook forward slash Justin Johnson Live and uh, YouTube as well. But if you go to the website, justinjohnsonlive.com, that's got all the links for you there. And pre-order links. If you want to get the album now, you can be the first ones to get it when it gets, uh, you know, finally gets shipped out and everything like that. And why hasn't Jimmy Kimmel contacted you yet? You've got to have all these media people kind of crowding around you because not only are you physically a great guy to look at, the instruments are unique. You're obviously very able to have a conversation. You have an insight to what you do. Your personality is great. Uh, I'm sure Jimmy Kimmel, has he contacted you yet? I'm waiting for it, man. If he's for. watching, give me a call, brother. You know what? I'm going to send this to Jimmy Kimmel's folks. I'm sending this, by the way, to Sirius XM because I'm trying to get the show on Sirius XM to have the very unique artists because I'm, I'm tired of driving down the road, listening to radio and hearing the same formula constantly. In fact, to be honest with you, I don't have that problem because I don't listen to radio anymore because it's not, not unique at all. So I, I just, from the perspective of uniqueness and, and something that needs to be heard, I, I, I'm trying to get the show on Sirius, and hopefully you'll be part of the. Yeah. Hopefully you'll give me permission to send this to Sirius. Do you mind? Absolutely, man. Okay, cool. So I'm going to do that. I appreciate you being on the show. It's a thrill to have you on. In April, just hit me up and tell me how the album's going. And okay. if, if you don't mind, sometime within April, it's it's coming up on April pretty soon here. If you don't mind coming on, I won't occupy your whole time here, your whole hour for the show here. But if you don't mind coming on and just giving me a quick announcement 
of one of the tracks that you would love to have on the show, and I would love to premiere one of your tracks from your new CD on the show, if you don't mind. Yeah, man, uh, definitely. We'll stay in touch about it, and uh, that all sounds good, brother. Cool. It was great having you on the show again. Do you mind if we'll take out the show with... We'll do back-to-backs because it's a video show and I get to do as long a show as I feel like. So let's uh, let's pick two more and we'll do back-to-backs. What should we do? Um, you know, I'd, lo- I'd love for you to play the Johnny B. Good as a tribute to Chuck. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, let's see. Anything else, man? You just pick one. Pick one from the YouTube channel or something like that you like. Okay, I'll and, do that. Uh, and I'll, yeah. announce, I'll announce it like the, the superior DJ I try to be, right? <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah, you were great to have on the show, man. I appreciate I appreciate the fact that you came on months ago, and I just did the audio show, and now I'm in the video, and I, I'm thankful that you came on the show. Thanks so much. Good luck in Nashville. Where are you headed next? Where's your next couple gigs? Where are they? What states um, are they yeah. in? I see. I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, Four State Guitar Fest coming up, um, and that's going to be out in, in Missouri, and uh, so that'll be my next one. And then all my all my shows are at uh, you know the website justinjohnsonlive.com on the tour page. So I've got the full lineup there. Cool. And by the way, my wife was listening to some of the videos because I pull up all the entertainers that come on my show. I pull them up, and my wife, who's a Buddhist, she's a Japanese Buddhist. She said, "Jesus Christ, this guy's good." <laughs> so, <laughs> so there you go. Thanks again, Justin, for being the show. Tre- tremendous having you on. Thanks so much. Take care, brother. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Play one for you on the cigar box guitar. This was made by a local luthier, a good friend of mine out in uh, Hillsboro, right down the road, named Bob Johnson. He makes a lot of these uh, wonderful cigar box instruments, his old traditional instruments. Appreciate it uh, again being here. My name is Justin Johnson. I'm going to do a new one for you. This one's called Rooster Blues. <laughs> Thanks again very much. Appreciate it.